for a while on object interactions. So this is even a subset from video understanding, just focusing on persons interacting with objects and particularly trying to capture natural interactions rather than scripted ones. Um, so last year we released the Epic Kitchens dataset and part we were focusing on these wearable cameras, focusing on what the wearer is doing as opposed to another person they're observing. So this is a wearable camera and trying to understand what the person wearing the camera is doing. This gives a very unique insight into object interactions because you're actually seeing the hands as they approach and interact with the object. Because such footage isn't available on YouTube, we have to go all the way from data collecting, giving people cameras, trying to do something naturally that is taking it all the way to their homes and trying to record everything they do in their kitchens for several days. Start it as soon as you step into the kitchen and don't stop until you actually want to leave. And then narrating such a thing, annotating is very hard and that's why we borrowed the concept from movies where we ask people after they finish recording to talk over their recordings, giving us these live narrations which we use to collect dense action segments and active objects. That is the object they're interacting with with a bonding box and we have some open challenges. The first set of winners we announced in CVPR and the server is open for you to try. So from these single points where people are actually talking about the action, <coughs> we went and fixed the start and end time. And usually we said this is lots of effort. After Jeff's talk, I'm going to convince people that it's improving their memory and that's why they need to kind of <laughs> click these single timestamps. So that's a new trick that I've learned today. And these are the type of action segments you're getting. Some are overlapping, so you might be doing multiple things at the same time. But if you start looking at more of these videos, you're seeing the major difference between scripted actions, so when you tell people what to do when they're actually acting, and natural interactions in your kitchen. And if that's what we're targeting, maybe we should really look at that, this gap and try to work on it. We also have annotations for the active object. This is every two frames per second. Um, and this is the object they're interacting with at a time. And like Cordelia said, anything with natural interactions, you have a long tail. This is log scaled. So most of the data set is opening and closing and putting and taking. But there is also a long tail on verbs <coughs> and on nouns. Right. So this was the effort to collect natural interactions. And from it, lots of interesting, what I call fine-grained problems emerged. And I have cheated. So instead of spending the 15 minutes telling you about this effort, we just brought the whole team here to give you posters in the poster session. So we've been working on skill determination and action completion. Hazel and Farnoosh are here and can tell you how we can look at two videos of people performing the same action and trying to decide who is performing it better. Farnoosh has been focusing on this concept of completion, when you attempt the action but you don't successfully complete it. We've been doing lots of work on times and when the action takes place and whether time matters. And Davide we can tell you more about how you can learn from single timestamps. And Will can take you through all the different temporal models we tried on Epic and whether they make an impact. And then we have some effort on multimodal and again, Vangelis can tell you about vision and audio. This is work that we presented in ICCV. And Mike can be telling you about vision and language. Again, some work that will be presented in ICCV. And Johnny's going to show you some ongoing work on using multimodal for domain alignment. So with this cheating happening, I can go and tell you about a few things that there are no posters for, which I believe I give you an insight into the challenges I believe currently are in video understanding. And that is how can we learn from more than the data we actually have. So DDLSTM is this concept of looking at two videos captured in different settings. So these are off-the-shelf data sets, 50 salad and MPI. And the visual features are very different. It's very difficult to believe that you're going to find common visual features that will act into these things. So we were asking whether if you start from data set specific features, optimize for this viewpoint, whether there is something that you can learn in the temporal level. Is there something you can share in these LSTMs? And this was the first attempt to see if there is some domain alignment interests in the recurrent networks. So you start from a batch normalized LSTM, and the main trick is to go and have different batch normalization parameters for these different data sets. So basically you have a batch with these two data sets, the red and the yellow, and then you have this cross-contamination parameter that you tune with the network to see whether you want to 
learn your batch normalization parameters only in one domain, or whether there is something useful <coughs> that you can borrow from the other domain. So you have two batch normalization, two cross-contamination uh, functions. These are fully differentiable, so you can train this end to end. And you can also do it on multiple levels, because you can imagine that the first level might be very specific for the data set, but if you go higher, maybe there is some temporal dependencies. This was really fishing in the dark. We didn't know whether there were any shared things between the different data sets. Um, but when you look at the numbers, there is some promise there. So this is breakfast as the target data set learned with two other data sets. And we're comparing joint training, pre-training fine tuning, which is the typical way to learn from multiple data sets using one batch normalization parameters or using these two. And in every case, DDLSTM is outperforming. Um, what it's very difficult to see what it is, it's actually learning. So we went and said, okay, is that kind of scaling to any subsets of two data sets? So we went on something bigger. So this is 50 salad, but training on three different big data sets. Two of them are in very different domains. They're sports. 50 salad is cooking, activity net, and UCF is kind of sports. And you can <coughs> see that pre-training fine tuning and the DLSTM isn't really doing much on 50 salad. Once we go into Epic, which is this kind of cooking center data set, then pre-training fine-tuning is telling us there is something shared, which is how we say there is something to learn from this data set, but DDLSTM is giving you an additional boost. So maybe there is something there. It's a very early insight. The other work I want to tell you about is these types of videos. So if I ask you kind of what does this video represent? Oh, I don't know what's doing this, but hopefully kind of this is an action you can recognize. And it is an action of closing. This action actually never exists in the data set. This is the video that was part of the data set. Right? So this is a person opening. And this has been time reversed. The concept of the arrow of time has been discussed in the video community. And, and Andrew and others have said, maybe if we focus on learning the arrow of time, you're going to learn good representations. However, what we've seen is for a number of object interactions, reversing remains reasonable. And we provide results of a perception study where humans are unable to decide whether the reversed video or the forward video is a better representation of the action. We say there are certain classes for which when you revert the video, you have another example of the same class. We call these invariant classes. This is typical data augmentation. But there are also other classes where when you revert, you actually have another example of a different class. And of course, there are irreversible actions where the arrow of time matters and we need to understand that you can't really, something is not going to bounce back from the floor. So we were looking at this as a different form of data augmentation. We're calling this video transforms with label transforms. So this is the case where you, let's say, for example, <coughs> do horizontal flipping. You're changing the video. But potentially, in certain cases, you're also changing the label. This appears if you're doing horizontal flipping. This also appears if you're doing time reversal. And you can kind of start piling these on top of one another and saying, I'll do horizontal flipping and time reversal. And maybe that's, again, another example of a different class. So instead of going linguistic about this, saying opening is the reverse of closing, we're saying, can the models actually find these correlations? So this is a model trained using TRN, so it's time sensitive. And then we do horizontal flipping. And you'll see these. I'm not showing you the classes, but you can you'll see these pairings, right? You know that once you do this, then a particular example is moving to another class and going back. And similarly for time reversal. So only from these confusion matrices, you can find these dualities. Then if we now do this video transform, but also with the corresponding label transform, you go back into this nice, good explanation. And then we asked, can we do zero-shot learning? And in this result, every other vi class you see here is zero-shot. So you have never seen that. You've just seen <coughs> the, either the horizontal flipped or the time-reversed example. And you know, this is really promising. This is saying, maybe we can do more with the videos we're collecting if we think about these dualities in actions. And these are some of the examples of zero-shot learning. So closing has never seen. You've only seen reverses of opens. This is an actual real close. And it is correctly recognized using these zero-shot setups. So this just appeared on um, an archive. And Will is here if you want to talk more about this. OK, um, so what do I think? There, I think there are missed opportunities 
in doing fine-grained video understanding that might help us solve the big picture. So not doing clip level, asking us ourselves questions that are beyond clip level, because that might give us, by default, better models to do better clip level explanation. <coughs> and I think this has a direct impact on robotics and HCI. The concept of trying to say, how do I, I don't know, open this door, right? If you do clip level, that's very different than if you actually focus on understanding the skill in performing it or the completion of the action. Multimodal approaches, I think everybody agrees, is something we have to look at. I was myself kind of always saying, I'm vision, I'm going to do audio, until we recorded Epic and I started hearing these videos and realizing I am able to recognize the action better by just hearing it. Um, there are still challenges, and one which is not very much talked about in the action recognition community is something we call the verbs dilemma. Um, so we have actions like this, which we can call an open action, and we're happy to call them open. Then you can see another example, and somehow we're happy to call this a cut action, and we can learn good examples, whether it is recognition or retrieval, to say there is open and there is cut, but then we don't really face these types of actions where only in this context open becomes cut. So open and cut are distinct, but in this particular example, by context, by the object you're using, they're actually overlapping. Um, and currently in verbs, we're either relying on these distinctive verbs that don't overlap, or we're going the other end, which is we're relying on verb nouns or full sentences, but then we can never really know how to open something we haven't trained for, which I think is very limiting. Um, some of the words we've been working on is whether multi-verbs helps, whether if I tell you this is something you can open by holding and pulling, that kind of already gives you, and I kind of go back to this saying, this is what might we want to do if we want to do robotics, if we actually want to act on these actions. Um, so the verbs dilemma is one big challenge. Overlapping actions and interactions is another big challenge you can't solve if you're doing clip level. And we have a good number of these in natural interactions. Collecting natural data as an epic was one attempt. Egocentric videos allows you to go and kind of record where you go. How to collect more natural data sets that are non-scripted is a big question I am particularly interested in finding more interesting answers for. And then whether we can utilize more than the one challenge problem we have or the one task problem. Whether if we train for I don't know, action localization, that model can be helpful for skill determination. Um, and if we kind of focus on one data set, one task per paper, we might be limiting ourselves in the ability to find better video understanding. Thank you very much.